Yep, happened again. I stand up here, everybody gets quiet. Excellent. Uh, it's actually really good to feel that this morning. I can speak for probably everyone in here when I say uh, we have missed everybody. I know there are a lot of smiling faces in here who are glad to, uh, to be back in this building worshiping uh, together this morning. I do want to remind everybody, we, we, we thank you for uh, the understanding that you have and the processes that have been put into place to ensure that uh, people feel safe when they're coming in. And so we do want to remind everybody to, uh, to mind the signs that have been put up around the building and, and also wash your hands uh, as much as you possibly can. Uh, wash your hands. We've got hand sanitizer stations set up all over the building. At the conclusion of this morning service, we will have a process in which the ushers will dismiss people by rows just to keep things uh, simple and moving. And so uh, we'll, we'll let you know more about that whenever we get to the, the end of service. But we are very glad to have everyone here this morning. Glad to have you all here to, to worship with us. Um, <clears throat> it's been a while since we have had some singing in this building. And so I, I said this this morning and I'm going to or earlier this morning, I'm going to say it again for this one. We're going to sing a lot uh, today. We're going to sing a, a few more songs than usual and we're going to be moving pretty quickly through them. So we're going to stand for these first few songs. If I could go ahead and ask you to stand. We're going to sing these first few songs really quickly. I just ask that you, you sing out because it's, it's been a while. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his force with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad.
God, we come before you now thanking you so much for the ability to be here this morning, God, the, the time that we have to, to share with one another in worshiping you. And Father, I pray that as we continue into this worship service that we do it in a manner that is pleasing to your sight. God, we want to pray for those who uh, are unable to be with us this morning for, for one reason or another. We want to pray for those who have been affected by what's going on uh, outside in our country and in the world right now. We would just pray that, that you would place your comforting hands on those who need it, place your healing hands on, on those who need it as well. And God, I pray that you, would, <clears throat> that you would help us continue to be your church within these walls and outside as well. We thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you have given us one of those blessings, especially being your son who died on the cross for our sins. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Be seated, please. Scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 121. I'll be reading the ESV version. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. I love you, Lord, and I live my voice to worship you, O my soul. Rejoice, enjoy my King. Yeah. 
Good morning. I know that uh, we've all probably been using, uh, most of us have been using these for a while, but I think it's important just for a second to talk about the mechanics of it if you don't know how to use the to-go Lord's Supper cups. Uh, the top has a little film that you can peel off. That's where your bread's at. A um, little uh, clear film, and then the, the bottom tab is the bigger tab that opens up uh, for the juice. Uh, this morning, we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, meditating on the, the Lord's Supper and what we're going to be talking about. Over the last three months, uh, a lot of us have adopted a common vocabulary, a uh, common vocabulary of words that we may not have really used or thought about before, uh, before this pandemic happened. Uh, to name a few, flatten the curve is one that I, I feel like I'd never really heard about before uh, all of this began. Uh, the difference between essential and non-essential businesses and jobs and, and, and lines of work. Uh, the differences between a symptomatic carrier and an asymptomatic carrier of COVID-19. Uh, the word pandemic is, is commonplace in our vocabulary now. I know that's not a new word by any means, uh, but it is one that we uh, have been saying with far more frequency. Um, the term herd immunity, which I, I just think it kind of sounds funny, but I understand the, the idea about it. Um, and then obviously COVID or coronavirus or the other three or four names of this virus uh, that it goes by officially in different uh, news outlets. Uh, but I think the biggest term of all that, that has come to be commonplace in our vocabulary and in our mindset is the phrase social distancing. Social distancing is on the news. Uh, it, every news station, about every 20 minutes when the, the stories recirculate. Uh, it's spoken of and written about on the internet, on Facebook, on everything that you might be consuming online. Uh, it's printed on signs all across our church building this morning. Uh, it is in any grocery store that you go to, any hardware store that you go to, any place that you go, a restaurant, uh, now that they're open, uh, will have signs and regulations for social distancing. It's a mindset that we've adopted. To some of you, social distancing, hearing that phrase makes you roll your eyes. Some of you, it terrifies you. Uh, and I know that there's a big spectrum of, of thought about this. Because of social distancing, we have not gathered here in this building uh, since March the 15th in hopes of slowing the spread of the virus among, uh, among our own people, among those who may be less or more vulnerable uh, than others. And even this morning as we're gathered, uh, half gathered together again here, uh, we're, we're still concerned about remaining distant from one another, keeping the distance and making sure that people are protected. We've come to the point in our gathering today where we're going to be celebrating this Lord's Supper together. And as we transition to this thought about celebrating uh, the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, I want us all to dwell for just a moment on the idea of distance, uh, this social distance that we have in our minds so continually. But not what I want us to dwell on is not social distance in what we're experiencing today, but the social distance or the, the spiritual difference between distance between us and our God. Under the old covenant, there was an ever-present understanding of distance around the worship of God. God was near in some ways, but, but sin created a tangible separation or a distance between us and God. So because of this distance, there had to be a mediator put in place, which was the Old Covenant priesthood, and the priesthood would spend their days making sacrifices so that the people would be covered, uh, their sins would be covered, and they could draw near to and approach God closer. But because these sacrifices, this, this covering from the sacrifices was only temporary, it had to be done repeatedly, continually, over and over and over again. Because this covering was temporary and it happened over and over again, there was always a constant awareness among the people of God about the distance between God and them. And it continued for hundreds and hundreds of years. But then the good news is that Jesus comes and something different happens. Jesus is made to be the mediator of a new covenant, and he's made to be a priest. And as a priest, he uh, gives an offering or a sacrifice of his own, but this time it's not an animal, but it's himself. When Jesus makes this sacrifice to cover his people, his sacrifice is noticeably different 
from the old covenant sacrifices because those temporary sacrifices were superseded by this one time sacrifice. But Jesus once for all sacrifice, it, it, it does more than just save us time when we worship God. It does more than just do away with animal sacrifices. With this sacrifice, Jesus closes the distance between God and us. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23. Hebrews 10, 19 through 23 reads, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest or a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You see, without an effective sacrifice to cleanse our sin and to cover our sin, there is and there remains an incalculable distance between God and us. But in Jesus, there's no longer a distance between God and his people. If you are in Christ this morning, you have a confidence, according to this text, you should have a confidence to enter the holy places. That means to enter where God is, to be near to God because that distance has been closed. But that distance hasn't been closed because of anything that we've done, but because of the shed blood of Jesus and the new and living way that he has opened up for us through his body. This Lord's Supper is the event that Jesus gave his church in order to express and celebrate the giving of himself. And I hope that you can dwell on that this morning. Because that giving of himself forever closed the distance between God and his people. And Jesus did this through two necessities of human existence, food and drink, uh, the bread and the juice. Now these things that tie all of us together that we, are, that we have to have, what it usually does is it brings us together around a table. But as you know, this morning you're still sitting uh, roughly six feet apart from one another from the different parties that are here. It may be out of respect and love that we are remaining distant from one another and that for now we are using these individual communion cups. But you have to realize that this act brings us together in ways that a six-foot gap can never take away. This Lord's Supper brings us together because Jesus has brought us together. We may be socially distant this morning, but we have been brought near to God forever. And because of that, we've been brought near together forever. So as we meditate on the Lord's Supper this morning, let us draw near to God with full assurance of faith, confidence that he has saved us. Let's pray together for the bread. God, we thank you so much for Jesus, for the sacrifice that he offered of himself. We thank you that you provided a real sacrifice, that Jesus uh, has a body, had a body, and was sacrificed bodily and rose again bodily. We know that this bread represents his body, <clears throat> and as we partake of it, we unite ourselves again with his body. God, as we take this bread, help us to dwell on the reality of that sacrifice and the, the efficacy of that sacrifice. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's now pray for the, the cup. God, again, we thank you so much for the for the sacrifice that was wrought on our behalf so that we could draw near to you. God, we know that the blood of Jesus has brought us near and has cleansed us of our sins. Help us as we dwell on this reality uh, and as we uh, take this juice that we recognize and remember the sacrifice that Jesus went through, 
the blood that he offered and that cleanses us continually as we draw near to him. Thank you for everything. So Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, don't lose these cups after, uh, whenever you're dismissed at the end, there's trash cans in the back that you can drop your, uh, the trash from these, um, in those trash cans. So please don't leave those. We're still, uh, giving a time to give of, uh, your offering. Um, if you walked in and you saw it on the table out back, uh, there's a, a wooden box that you can place your offering in if you brought check or, or money. Um, there's also still available and will be available uh, from here on out uh, online giving. So if you go on the Scenic Hills website, um, you'll be able to find the tab that, that leads to the online giving uh, to where you can give of your offerings online. But as we think about that, I want to draw us back into prayer uh, as, we, um, as we wrap up the, the offering. God, thank you again, as we always thank you for all the ways that you blessed us. We know right now uh, that for a lot of people, this, uh, this is not a time for, or this is a time of, of great financial difficulty. Uh, we know that there have been many who have been let go from jobs or furloughed from jobs with no pay, and, and that um, what seemed like it was going to be just a few weeks has turned into a bit longer. Uh, we're thankful that, that things are opening back up and people are, are, are able to go back to their jobs and, and earn income. But right now, God, as we, uh, as we prepare to offer our money uh, to the work of, of this church and, and, and to you and to what you will do with it, help us to think in ways that maybe our, our offering can go to help those among us who, who may be in need uh, because of a loss of job or, or something uh, to that effect. God, help us all uh, as we struggle through this time uh, of difficulty that if a need arises in our, in our lives, help us to have the, uh, the courage and the confidence in you to uh, make that known to our church family, the struggles that we may, we may be going through financially or otherwise. Uh, God, prepare our hearts and help us to give with a pure and clean conscience. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen.
blessed be your name. <clears throat> Casey, you're pretty good. That's like, what, 20 songs already? Yeah. So you're holding up. Good job. I got to tell you, I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be here this morning. Um, even, even with you. Again, um, and for all those that were at, nine, at the nine o'clock, they say, hey. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, no, they did. Uh, maybe not all at once, but um, but they did. Uh, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm really excited to be back here uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason is um, I actually get to see live people uh, when I do this. It was really weird uh, to preach to an empty room. I've told you that. I never got used to it. Uh, I never got comfortable with it, but nonetheless, we, it worked. Um, the guy suggested me just putting your pictures up and then, you know, in the room, and then I could preach to your picture. But then I thought I would just get blank stares back, um, so then I didn't do that. And, and the other reason I'm, I'm really excited uh, this morning is that I can finally move again. Um, you couldn't see this on the video, 
uh, but literally on either side of me were two chairs. Um, I had to put one on this side and one on this side so I wouldn't wander too far out of the camera. Um, so yes, I will be moving this morning and probably a lot because I'm kind of enjoying my freedom to go wherever I want. Paul's back there having a fit because, oh, the Mevo's out of focus now. Um, but that's okay. Now I'm going to run back over here and he's going to try to catch me. Um, but nonetheless, it's good to be back, isn't it? Um, but as good as it is, I, I got to tell you, there's a lot of people in the world right now that are struggling. <laughs> there's all kinds of reasons for that. Um, people have been furloughed. They've been laid off. They've lost their jobs. Uh, they're not getting paid. Um, they're having trouble paying their bills, making their car payment, making their house payment. They, they, they need help, and they need it now. I know when Dana got laid off, um, we went through the, the process of filing for unemployment, which took five days and about 60 hours on a computer just to get her into the system, only for them to come back and deny it um, after everybody's saying, oh, sure, you can get unemployment, no problem. Uh, but people are dealing with all kinds of stuff, and it's frustrating, and it weighs on you. And, 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 and people, are they, they don't know what life holds in the future. And, and many of them, their future consists of hours, not weeks. It's not what's going to happen six months from now or years from now. What they're worried about today is what's going to happen tomorrow. Because they need help today. And in addition to that, there's a whole other subset of people who, who are struggling with, with trying to figure out what the future is going to look like in their life. You know, because their plans that they had set in stone have now been thrown to the wind. Things, of, things that, that they thought were certain are no longer certain. People who had retirement accounts and, 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 and a portfolio and stuff, man, the stock market crashed and all of a sudden it's worth half of what it was before. And they're wondering, is it ever going to come back? Am I going to have enough to retire? People who have been laid off are sitting there thinking, am I even going to have a job to go back to? I just saw where J.C. Penney Filed chapter 11 bankruptcy on Friday. Another one bites the dust, so to speak, because of all that's going on. There's uncertainty about the future, and people just want a little hope to know that things are going to be okay again. You know, we've been in the, in the 23rd Psalm now for the last couple of weeks, and I want to I finish that up today, but, but I just want to ask you this question as we begin this morning. Do you know somebody, or maybe that somebody is you, who needs help or needs hope? Because I don't think you have to look far to find somebody that fits in either one of those categories. Everywhere around us there are people who are needing help and they're needing hope. And I think as we, as we wrap up the 23rd Psalm, I think we will see through David's eyes where he thinks the answer to those two questions come from. And maybe they'll help us as well. If you got your Bibles... Let's go to Psalm 23. i got to remember to click. There we go. Let's read this together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I should have changed that slide. Oh, thank you, Paul. So far, we've been looking at this, and we've been looking and identifying the, the characteristics of the shepherd and what he does for us in our life. And, and so far, we've talked about how, how God, as our, as our shepherd, provides for us and how he, he protects us. And, and this morning, we're going to look at the third activity of the shepherd that I think David highlights for us, and it's so needed in our world today. And it's simply this idea that, that our shepherd, our godly shepherd, God preserves us. He preserves us. He does it 
in, in the very two ways that, that we talked about already that people are needing. He, he does it through help not only for today, but hope also for tomorrow. Listen to the first one. In, in providing us help for today, listen to what David says. He, 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 he's talking about this cup, and he says, My cup overflows. Now think about this in terms of the shepherd. And I, I know people think that, that David's flopping analogies back and forth. I think he's still talking about his shepherding days here. And, and David would have a cup with him always because he needed water as well. And I think David is remembering back to those times when he was out with his sheep and he was tending those herds that David was never in want, that God always provided for him. That his cup was always full, so to speak. He always had what he needed. Now, let's, let's separate this from our world right now. David's not saying, I always got what I wanted, but he's saying, I always had what I needed. And that's something our culture and maybe we need to understand and get a grip on. God is not in the, in the want-satisfying business as much as he is in the need-providing business. God will always provide what we need need. As a matter of fact, a couple of months ago, as we were studying through Ephesians, we got to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. You remember what that says? Now to him who is able to do, how much? Far more abundantly than all we ask or all that we imagine. God is always in the habit of filling things up over. He's always in the habit of going beyond. And, and if, you, if you're in that position today and you need Help, let me just say this, you're in the right place. I can't tell you how many times I have had people in my office and they've come in and they've said, oh, I need help today. Okay, what's going on? Well, I need help with a utility bill or I need help with my, my car payment or I need help with food or I need help with, with whatever. And so I'll sit there and we'll talk about that need and, and, and how we can, we can help. And invariably, I'll ask them, okay, I, that aside, where, where do you attend church? Where do you go to church? Oh, I don't go to church. I don't have any use for church. I, I, I like God. I like Jesus, but I ain't got no use for church. And in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, do you know where you're at right now? You're in a church asking for help, but you're telling me you have no need for church. And it makes no sense. But I hope, church, we realize, and this is so important for us to understand, God provides us everything we need. But one of the ways, probably the primary agent through which God dispenses his help to this world is through the church. Think about it. We help each other. Hobbs was in the, in the first service. I didn't mention this when she was here. She cried enough. Uh, Hobbs just now figuring out how to use her legs, if y'all didn't know that. Um, I think maybe she'll be okay now. But, but think about this for a minute. She hurt her legs, and, and she, she needed help. And if I know Barbara, she prayed about it, right? Y'all believe Barbara prays? Y'all know who I'm talking about. I, I know Barbara prays. And, and, and Barbara needed help because her legs were hurt. Well, guess what? Deborah shows up, moves in. I'm pro Barbara's probably going, that ain't what I prayed for. <laughs> <laughs> but, but here's my point. Here's my point. Barbara needed help. I know Barbara prayed, and God answered her prayers through Deborah. And God's done that so many times. I can't tell you how much food's probably been delivered out of this place to people who needed help. People who needed encouragement and who came? The church comes. Why? Because the church is the primary agent for God dispensing help in the world. And let me tell you this morning, if you're here and you need help, it's available. And, and don't be ashamed and, and, and don't be anything. Just know we are all the body of Christ. And for us to function properly as the body of Christ, our needs need to be met. And that's what we're about. That's what... When Jared was talking about our offering, that's there. Why? So we can help people. Why? Because God preserves us. He helps us in our need. 
David understood that. But not just in our physical need, he also helps us in our spiritual need as well. Listen, he goes on to say this. He says, not only that, but surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We skip over this sometimes, and we just kind of read through it to get to the end of the psalm. But understand what David's saying here. The goodness of God. How good is the goodness of God? There ain't nothing gooder. As I said before, my mother's going to roll over in her grave because I just said gooder. But I don't know what other word to use. The goodness, there is no gooder than God's good. Say that three times really fast. (laughs) Okay? It's so good. And then he goes on, not only his goodness, but his mercy. Another translation of that is loving kindness. Go to Psalms 136. You don't have to turn over there, but go read it. I think 26 times in Psalm 136, David says, you know, your loving kindness endures forever. Your loving kindness endures forever, over and over and over. But what he's saying is simply this, your mercy, your loving kindness. And he says, surely. And that word surely simply means positively. So David, there's no doubt. He says, your goodness and your mercy shall follow me. But even that word follow me is a bad translation. Because if you go back in the Hebrew, the actual word there simply means to chase. Now think about this for a minute. What David is saying is, God's goodness and God's mercy is chasing me. Isn't that a beautiful thought when you think about it? It's not just available, it's Chasing me. Let me read you a quote. Matt Chandler wrote this about Psalm 23, especially this part. He says this, Not only is there going to be goodness and mercy that followed me, it's there every morning when I get up. And I turn around, and here it is again. I turn around, and there's goodness. I turn around, and there's mercy. (coughs) I blow it again, and there's God's goodness and mercy. I get exhausted And there's God's goodness and his mercy. I snap at my spouse and my kids, and there's God's goodness and mercy. I blow it at work, and there's God's goodness and mercy. I can't get away from it because it's chasing after me. Why? Because God loves us so much as our shepherd. He's chasing us with his goodness and mercy. He preserves us by helping us physically. He preserves us by helping us spiritually. Why? Because he loves us so much. But not only does he provide help for today, he also provides hope for tomorrow. Listen to what David says. He says, And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Dwell. It means to reside. It means to settle down. It means to be at home with. And David sees this as as a confident assurance. He sees this as something that will happen. If you think about it in the analogy of the sheep, the sheep, they've been through the green pastures, they've been to the still waters, they're full, they're satisfied, they're, they're taken care of because they're in the company of the shepherd. They've eaten in the very presence of enemies. Why? Because the shepherd's there with the rod and the staff, and they have no fear. And they're living at peace. And now they're in this fold of the shepherd. And they're enjoying the comfort of being with the shepherd. They want to be there. They love the safety and security of being with their father, with, with their, father, with their shepherd. They have been well preserved. John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says this, I, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. I love David's language here. Because he says, I shall dwell. I shall live. I will live in God's house forever. He doesn't say, I might. He doesn't say, I hope to. He doesn't say, if I've lived a faithful life, if I've been faithful enough to God, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. He doesn't say that. He says, I will live with God forever. How can he do that? David's guilty of of adultery. David's guilty of murder. He's guilty of all kinds of sins. How can he say, I will live with God forever? 
the exact same way I can say confidently, I will go to heaven. And there's no doubt in my mind. When this body leaves this earth, my next eye, the very next thing these eyes are going to see is Jesus Christ. I have no doubt of that. I am 100% confident in the faith I have, but my faith is not in myself. You see, because just like David, David knew himself, and he knew he had sin, and he knew he had problems, but he also knew the shepherd. And his confidence in his salvation was based not on what he had done, but on his God. And let me tell you something, church. Your faith has got to be based not on what you do or what you have done, but on what God did through Jesus Christ. If your faith and your confidence is in what Jesus did and not on what you have done, then you can be confident. And that's not self-righteousness. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something. If you knew my heart... <laughs> you see, I know myself. I know my sin. I know my weaknesses. I know my hang-ups. I know my flaws. And I know that my righteousness is, is like filthy rags compared to God. And there's nothing I can do to earn my way into heaven. It is only by the sacrifice of Jesus that I will be with my Lord. But I have confidence in His righteousness that He gives to me as being one of His sheep. He gives us hope. That's why John wrote in 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Listen to this. That you may know that you have eternal life. Not that you may doubt that you have eternal life. Not that you may hope that you have eternal life. Not that you may, well, if I do enough, I'll have eternal life. No, you can know today. You can know today that if you are a sheep of the shepherd, that when you die, you will go to the shepherd's fold. That's not self-righteousness. That's not confidence in yourself. That's confidence in the sacrificial offering of Jesus on the cross. Jesus comes for us. This is the mic drop section of Psalm 23. If, if David was holding a mic, he said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Boom. Over. Mic drop. It's that statement. It's done. Folks, it's not braggadocious. It's not self-righteous to have confidence in Christ. It is to have confidence in yourself. So understand what the shepherd does. He provides, he protects, he preserves us. I hope you've gained some insight as we've worked through this psalm together. A couple of lessons, and, and the lesson's yours, some, 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 some things that looking at it as a whole. The first is simply this. If you're not a part of the flock, join the shepherd's flock. <laughs> okay? I'll say it again. If you want the calm of the psalm, you have to be one of the shepherd's sheep. And understand, he's chasing after you right now. That's what it says. John chapter 10, verse 14 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own. This is Jesus talking. And they know me. But understand this. Think about this. In order for Jesus to become the good shepherd, first he had to become a sheep. He had to become the perfect lamb. John said in John chapter 1, Behold, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus became the lamb. He died as the lamb so that, he becomes, so that he could become the shepherd. And today, if you're not a part of his flock, he wants you to be. You can know him. You can know him. Don't leave without knowing the shepherd. The second lesson, stay close to the shepherd. <laughs> I, I, I've talked about it many times. I love my dog. Y'all know. Twiggy, love my dog. Twiggy, Twiggy, man, come home from anywhere and Twiggy comes running and she's right there and she jumps and she wants a hug and she wants a pat and she wants a pet. And she's kind of like sheep in that regard. Sheep, when the shepherd's in the fold, they will rub up against the shepherd's leg until he bends down and pats it on the head. 
There's reassurance. Hey, yeah, I love you. I'm here. I'm here. Because understand this. If you're a sheep, the quickest way to get water is to be by the shepherd. The quickest way to get food is to be by the shepherd. The easiest way to have your needs met is to be close to the shepherd. Right? So understand, as we, Christ followers, as we follow Jesus, we have to understand, we have to stay close to the shepherd. But that also implies, if I'm close to the shepherd and the shepherd's in the flock, then I also will be close to the other sheep who are also in the flock. I'll say it again. You cannot have a relationship with Jesus Christ devoid of a relationship with the church. It's impossible. It was never intended to be that way. And I know in our world today that's, that's common and, and whatever, but it just doesn't work. It's not right. It's not biblical. I, okay? It's not how God designed it. And, and if you've strayed, if you've gone away, then come back. Come back. Come back. Matter of fact, Peter says it this way. 1 Peter 2.25, For you were straying like sheep, but now have come, now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. If you're straying, get back. If you're apart, get back. The last lesson is simply this. Follow wherever he leads. It may be through green pastures. It may be through dark valleys. Like right now. It may be during a time of uncertainty. It may be during a time when you don't know what's going on or, or your plans have been wrecked or your finances have been wrecked. It, it may be during a time when, when, when there just aren't any answers to be had. Those are the times when you need to be closest to the shepherd. The dark valleys we talked about last week. <coughs> Allow his protection to calm your heart. Back in the 1800s, about the only form of, of entertainment at that time were these traveling uh, actors, I guess you might say. Sometimes there'd be shows and whatnot, but actors would often travel from, from town to town. And they would, they would rent out a, a town hall or a saloon hall or whatever, and they'd put on like a little stage show. And, and one of the things they would do is they would recite famous scenes from you know, Shakespeare or whatnot for the crowd. Uh, it was their form of television back then, okay? And there was one particular actor who was traveling around. He came to a town, and, um, and he had gone through a series of, uh, of speeches for the crowd, and, and they were into it, and, and uh, he decided he was going to do something different. And at the end of his show, he kind of stepped to the front of the stage. He says, I don't normally do this. He said, but I'm going to take a request. Anybody have a request, something that you'd like me to to, to recite or to hear. And of course, hands went up and people were yelling, whatnot. And about halfway back in the middle of the crowd, there was an old, old man, weathered, dirty, and looked like he'd probably been working out on a ranch for, for years, tired. And he slowly raised his hand, and the actor saw him, and he said, You, sir, what would you like to hear? The little man lifted up his head and he said, can you, can you recite the 23rd Psalm? The actor thought for a minute and he said, yes, I can. And I will on one condition. He said, when I'm done, you come up here and you recite it too. The old man said, okay. So the actor started and, and he goes through the, the 23rd Psalm and and, and he was using every theatrical trick he could muster and vibrato and, and he would get loud and he would get soft and he would use his hands and he would use his arms and the, and the crowd was just enthralled. And when the actor finished, oh, there was a standing ovation and the people cheered because they loved what they saw and they loved what they heard. He stopped the crowd and he invited a little old man, come on up, sir. The little man slowly walked to the front, and he got on stage, and with his head bowed, he took his hat off, held it, and he started very softly in a broken, tired voice, the Lord is my shepherd. I got no wants. And as he worked through that entire psalm, Kind of like it is in here right now. <laughs> there wasn't a sound. 
And when he got to the end and he said, and surely goodness and mercy will follow me, you could see his face almost radiate like the wrinkles were softening. And, and in his mind, he was picturing that place where he was going to dwell with his shepherd forever. And when he finished, he looked up and no one said a word. No one applauded. Most of the audience was just in tears from what they had seen. The actor walked back to the middle of the stage and he said, now you understand why I wanted him to recite it. And the actor said this, he said, I know the psalm. He knows the shepherd. My question for you today is, do you just know the psalm? Or do you know the shepherd? Knowing the psalm isn't going to help much. Knowing the shepherd means everything. I'll say it again. If you want the calm of the psalm, you must be one of the shepherd's sheep. We're going to sing a song this morning. If you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, if he is not the shepherd of your life, I encourage you, submit to his will. Confess him as Lord of your life. Submit to his will for you to be baptized. And yes, we will do that. We will not do social distancing. I will get in the water with you. Okay? I'm not afraid. I'll even wash my hands while I'm in there. Okay? But besides that, if you need help today, church, we are church. We are the body of Christ. Let us be that for you. If you need help, let us help. Maybe you just need one of our shepherds to pray with you for the hope for you, that you need for tomorrow, for, the, for life that's going on. Whatever you need, let us help. But understand, don't leave without knowing the shepherd. If we can help you in any way, let us know as we stand and as we sing. Thank everyone again for being here with us uh, to worship this morning. Uh, again, after our closing song, we'll have a closing prayer and a little bit more instruction. We'll have our ushers. Uh, if you helped usher people in today, if you will uh, go back at the conclusion of our closing song, so or at least while the closing song is being sung, so that we can exit by rows, uh, as we mentioned a little bit earlier. But. Um, after the closing song, we'll be seated and we'll have everyone sit tight for just a little bit more instruction. Our closing song this morning is going to be Sing and Be Happy. We'll sing the first and last verse of that. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver light that shines in the heavens.
First of all, Ken, thank you for that lesson. Wonderful lesson. Great way to uh, wrap up that study on the 23rd Psalm. Um, do have a few announcements that we want to get through this morning before we are uh, dismissed in prayer. Um, Christian Gardner is uh, scheduled to have surgery tomorrow, and so we were notified of this uh, a little bit before services this morning, so we want to be in prayer uh, for her. Uh, that's all the information that I have at this time, but uh, I do want to remember uh, Christian in our prayers. Also, uh, Julie Brock went home from the hospital uh, earlier this week. She uh, spent uh, a, a small amount of time there in the hospital, and uh, she is at home at this time, so we are thankful that she was able to uh, to return home. Also, we do want to be in prayer uh, for the family of our sister Florence Crosswaith and her passing, and, uh, and I'm not sure of any uh, arrangements. I know it's going to be a private family service. I'm nothing at all. Michelle's shaking her head, so we don't have any information other than uh, at this time. So uh, we do want to be in prayer for that family uh, in the passing of our sister Florence. Uh, also, uh, we appreciate and thank all those uh, that have assisted in cleaning our building for services uh, at 9 o'clock this morning and those that were able to stay and help to clean in between services. We really appreciate that. And, uh, and for those that uh, are serving uh, or have served as ushers or security team members today, we really appreciate your efforts that you put forth in us being able to have services here today. Um, it has been good to be here. Um, I am not a, uh, an extrovert. Uh, as far as my need to see people all the time, but it has been a long two months, and I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to see people uh, here today. Um, I even sat at home this morning and pulled up the cameras on my phone so that I could see the people that were here this morning at 9 o'clock. So, uh, and we're going we're gonna to do that uh, at the conclusion of our prayer this morning. Uh, Paul, at the conclusion of the 9 o'clock service this morning, he took a brief video of those that were in attendance at 9 o'clock. We do still have a number of folks that are going to be unable to get out uh, for a period of time to even be able to be here for services at, uh, at either time. So he's going to take a brief just pan of the auditorium at the conclusion of our prayer this morning so that he can put a video together of both services so that uh, we can put that out for those folks that are going to be unable to be with us at all for a period of time while uh, this hopefully is starting to calm down is, uh, is our prayer uh, for sure. Are there any other uh, announcements or prayer requests that I need to make mention of this morning? If not, we'll be uh, dismissed in prayer and Paul's gonna take a short video and then the ushers will start to uh, lead people out of the building from, uh, from back to front. So uh, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious and loving master, Lord, we come to you now so very thankful for the opportunity uh, that we have had today to gather in this place. Uh, Father, we, we mention those words so often, but they mean so much more today uh, that we uh, were given uh, the blessing, the opportunity uh, to meet as your children, uh, to have a time of worship with one another, Father, and we know we have you to thank for that. And Father, as we move forward, we pray your continued blessings uh, on our congregation as well as our local community and, uh, and our entire nation, Father, as we uh, hopefully are, are starting to see uh, some of the cases of this virus uh, diminish or slow in the spread. Father, we pray that you would uh, help us to do what is needed uh, to uh, protect ourselves and to protect others and, uh, and follow the guidelines uh, as best that we can, Father, so that hopefully uh, we can uh, do what is needed so that uh, we can be back to uh, normal, uh, whatever that may be, Father, uh, just as soon as possible. Father, we pray that you would be with Christian Gardner and uh, the impending surgery that is to happen tomorrow. We pray that you would be with those doctors and nurses that are going to be administering to her. And uh, we pray that all things will uh, work well and, uh, and that you would be with her in her time of recovery. And uh, we've asked that you would bless the family uh, as uh, things are probably a little bit different than how we would normally handle these situations, Father. Uh, we're unsure of who all will be able to accompany her or be with her in, in this time. And Father, we pray that you would comfort the family uh, in a difficult situation. Father, pray that you would continue to watch over our sister Julie as she is uh, recovering at home. And Father, we pray that you would help to watch over her and strengthen her, uh, be with those that are trying to work out the different uh, medical situations that she has at this time to be able to restore her health if it is your will. Father, we pray that you would continue to watch over the family of our sister Florence Crossway and her recent passing, Father. 
We pray that you would be with them. And, uh, and Father, we know that uh, for those of us that, that knew her well, uh, we know that we'll get to see her again. And Father, we pray that you would be with the family and those that are left behind, Father, to comfort them in a very difficult time. Lord, we pray that you would uh, continue to watch over us, uh, be with us as we are dismissed from here, uh, keep us safe on our journeys wherever they take us, Father. And Lord, we pray that, uh, that you would uh, bring us back here again next week if it is your will. Lord, we love you and we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.